Secretary, I too would like to welcome you to the 2013 Georgia Technology Summit. I represent Primus Software, and we provide consulting and staffing services in the areas of business intelligence, application development, mobility, and quality assurance. And it is an honor to be a platinum sponsor of this great event for the past several years. On behalf of Primus, I hope you all leave today inspired by all the amazing innovation that is happening here in Georgia. It is a pleasure to introduce one of the pioneers of modern innovation and the technology industry as we know it, Bob Metcalf. During the 70s, Bob worked in the computer science laboratory of the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, where he created today's local area network standard, Ethernet. We won't be communicating without it. During the 80s, he founded IPO and grew the billion dollar computer networking company, 3Com, Corp, which ultimately merged with Hewlett Packard in 2010. In the 90s, Bob was the publisher of InfoWorld and since 2001, he has been a partner of Polaris Venture Partners. He is also a professor of innovation, Murchison Fellow of Free Enterprise, and a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the Cockrell School of Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. It's an honor, a privilege, and my immense pleasure to bring to the stage Mr. Bob Metcalf. So I'm here to uh, exchange best practices on the topic of innovation. I'm not here to uh, say that Austin is better than Atlanta or that Atlanta is better than uh, San Jose or Boston because I'm here under the assumption that innovation is not a zero-sum game and that we all gain by uh, exchanging best practices on how to innovate. I'm also here to uh, listen to our two other speakers, Matt and Ray, who are fantastic. And I, how did you get them? We can't get those people for our conferences. We have to work harder at that. And then I'm, I'm planning to jump meta on innovation and talk about innovations in innovation. Uh, and uh, I do need to apologize in advance for being annoying, because I was raised in New York, and then going to Texas didn't help at all. Uh, so in summary, I want to talk about uh, innovation, which is hot now, and it's very dangerous to be in a field which is hot, uh, because all sorts of noise and temptation flows around it, but innovation is hot these days. I'd like to talk about that, particularly in innovation, entrepreneurial, technological innovation at scale. Uh, and as I said, I'm going to jump meta and talk about innovation and innovations, and then if there's time, I'd like to talk about some uh, new directions that innovation seems to be taking. But I've been encouraged to encourage you all to ask questions. So you see these two microphones right here. If anyone would like to ask a question, you should just go to the mic and ask. How about now? Does anyone have a question? I'll wait. You're invited to ask a question at any time, but particularly if it's a hostile or a stupid question. <laughs> so in, in the career, which you just heard briefly summarized, I've been involved in a number of technology crusades. That's the word, crusades, like analog to digital. You, you, many of you are too young to remember that actually was a debate for a long time. Then hardware versus software, the trend going to software mainframe batch processing going to interactive time sharing, uh, personal computers getting networked, then the internet arriving, and then a series of internet disruptions, you know, like music and journalism and advertising and telecom. Uh, and then more recently, I've been involved in trying to solve energy, which is another technology crusade. And all of that uh, is leading to a party, which you're all invited to on May 22nd, we're going to celebrate the 40th birthday of Ethernet on May 22nd at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. The 40th. So my wife says, what have you done for us recently? <laughs> anyway, any excuse for a party? Any questions yet? See the card? See the card? It says questions. So this... this um, uh, 
idea of innovation. So I've had a number of careers, five of them, I'm in my fifth now, uh, all related to innovation. And it's because I believe that uh, the big goals are freedom and prosperity. Our big goals, my big goals are freedom and prosperity. And that is a virtuous cycle. Freedom and prosperity drive each other. And the, at the core of that is innovation. And in particular, what we call it here in America is the free enterprise system. And that's what I'm about, is trying to figure that all out and um, make the most of it. And I've developed a model which I'm working on as, I'm now a professor, so professors write papers and give lectures and do research. So my research is on the nature of entrepreneurial technological innovation at scale. And I've been, uh, come up with a model which I call the Dorio ecology. General Dorio is reputed to be the first venture capitalist 66 years ago, first modern venture capitalist. And this system, uh, this, not system, ecology has evolved uh, around his early ideas, and they have seven species. Ecologies have species. Many of them are in this room today, many of the species I'm going to list. There's a funding agencies of government, research professors who come up with ideas. They're graduating students, scaling entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, strategic partners, and early adopters. So those are the major species of this innovation ecology that I'm studying. Uh, uh, and in, in the nature of studying it, I've started to tweet. So four years ago, I started tweeting. Why did I start tweeting? Well, Steve Jobs showed me VisiCalc, and I was the last person on Earth to adopt it. And. Uh, and then Mark Andreessen showed me Mosaic. It took me two years to figure out what that was. So when Twitter came along, I said, not again. So I started using it four years ago. I have 12,000 followers. And, I, and whenever I tweet about innovation and startups, my number of followers goes up. And whenever I tweet about politics, my number of followers goes down. So I can control the number of followers just by topic selection. And I get many complaints and say, Bob, we'd really like you to stick to the topic of innovation, but avoid politics, because it's annoying. Have I mentioned annoying? <laughs> and I guess the reason I'm persisting in being annoying is that there is, a, there is no clear separation between innovation and politics. And I'm going to touch on this point a little later. Politicians are interfering with us in this innovation system. They try to help many good intentions, but as you know, the road to hell is paved with what? Good intentions. And there's a lot of them around. I'll comment on a few of those in a minute. So I was warning you about how annoying it's going to get. Any questions yet? So one of the things I do with students is I ask them, I give them a list of the most valuable companies in America, and I ask them which ones are startups, because we're in interested in startups and in, in uh, innovation. So I list Procter and Gamble and Ford and GM and General Electric and Microsoft and Apple and Kodak and Earthlink and Walmart and Facebook and Dell and Whole Foods and AT&T and Coca-Cola and I say, which ones are the startups? And the smart ones figure it out. They're all startups. They're just different ages. So IBM is my favorite hundred-year-old startup. So all progress can be attributed to startups at some point, just how far back you go. So we're, uh, once again, that's in arguing for the importance of studying startups. So what is your major understanding of the startup, startup process? I have a two by two matrix, which I'll show you. <laughs> I was on the board of the company that developed PowerPoint. We sold it to Microsoft in 1987 for $14 million. So I've not been using PowerPoint for a very long time. <laughs> uh, so this is the two by two matrix. It's very simplified. There's winning startup ideas and there's losing startup ideas. And then there's the ones that don't get funded and the ones that do. So you see why that's a two by two. So it's a test. Which of those boxes do you think has the most members in it. The, winner, the winners that get funded, the losers that get funded, 
the uh, winners that don't get funded, see the two by two? I think the answer is most of the companies in that little box are losers that don't get funded, most of them. That the innovation process is mostly about sorting through gazillions of ideas and teams and opportunities and finding the very few that are going to work. But there are other people who have different viewpoints. For example, there are, in Austin, we have a big argument and now, maybe you have it here too, uh, do we have enough venture capitalists in town to fund all of our startups? And there's two kinds of people, those who believe if only we had more money, we would have more successful startup activity. I'm of the reverse, I have a different view which comes from this model, which is we have plenty of money, we just need better startups. And that's, what, that's one of the exciting things about today, you're about to celebrate 40 cool, innovative companies, many of which are startups. I, I didn't look at the, the currently startups, I don't know what the percentage was. What, what is the percentage? Ben, do you know? About 20% are startups of the 40. Anyway, it's gonna be fun to watch the 10 uh, come by later. I think they're gems. I think that the, the winners that get funded are very rare. There is a special kind here, the, the, the winners that don't get funded. Some of those succeed anyway. That is, they don't need funding. A good example would be Microsoft, which I watched. Uh, Bill Gates found out how to get his customers to fund his company. Eventually, he took on a venture capitalist, but that was just for decoration. VCs are so pretty. So let me tell you about going to the University of Texas, and I'll do that by telling a story about Ted Turner. You ever, do you know who Ted Turner is? <laughs> this is a story that I think came from when he was still at uh, his cable company and before he married Jane Fonda. Uh, and the story goes like this. And the interesting thing is this story was told last week by the president of the uh, University of Texas. And he was commenting on innovation. And Ted Turner bought the classic movies and proposed to colorize them. And somehow the Congress of the United States decided that this was a topic that they should have a hearing about. Should Ted Turner colorize the classic film? So Congress had Ted Turner come to Washington and testify on this matter as if it was Congress's business. And when everyone had testified, they turned to Mr. Turner and they said, why should uh, the classic movies be colorized. And Ted Turner said, according to the president of the University of Texas, he said, cause they're mine and I want to. <laughs> <laughs> so I like the president of the University of Texas because he likes that story. And uh, that's one of the reasons I, I went there, is I, it's a very hospitable place for, and as is Georgia Tech. I was at Georgia Tech yesterday and I met the president there too, who's a fine man. And both of these presidents have good ideas about innovation and it's fun to work with them. So I've begun starting a thing called the Longhorn Startup Program at the University of Texas. And I've called it the Longhorn, why do I call it the Longhorn Startup Program? because I want our entrepreneurs at the University of Texas to be as supported and celebrated as our football players. We do a damn good job of supporting our football players at Texas. Now I want this, I don't wanna change that. I want our entrepreneurs to get the same attention. So I thought I would trick the university by calling it the Longhorn Startup Program. Uh, so we're, we're uh, moving in that direction. So I interviewed a, a young man recently who was the drum major of the band, and Texas has a band that at the foot, have you ever seen the Texas uh, band? Does Georgia Tech have a band at football games? Yeah. University of Georgia have one too? So I'm talking to this young man, he's about six foot four, handsome Texan with a big cowboy hat, and I found out he's the drum major. And I asked him about the band, and he told me an interesting fact. There's a hundred football players at a home game at Texas. You can see them on the field. They all weigh about 300 pounds. Actually, 16 of them weigh 300 pounds. I counted them. The band, on the other hand, has 400 members. Uh, so there's a lesson in that for us entrepreneurs and innovators, because one of the things that works about Silicon Valley is that when the startup, where I grew up, is where the startups 
blossom, they're surrounded by the band. There's the 400 people who are not in the startups who are supporting that. And I remember there's a man named John Ariaga, who you've never heard of. He rented me space in Silicon Valley. He's now a billionaire, I think. Uh, you could get printed circuit cards done from five different companies uh, when I was starting my company. So there's the, full, there's the band, and we have to, in developing our innovation system, our Longhorn startups, we have to pay attention not only to the hundred who are gonna be on the field of play as a startup founderati, I call them, but we also need the other 400 people who are in support of those startups. I think there's questions there. Would you like to ask a question, please? Yes, so going along with that theme, could you describe how the Metcalf Law or Metcalf's Law, which hopefully you're familiar with, uh, relates to innovation rather than networks. So do you see that network effect also affecting innovation and the ecosystem around things? Have you all heard of Metcalf's Law? <laughs> <laughs> so you go to Google and you type Metcalf's Law, and it's been around for a long time. And it started as a slide in a 3Com sales, uh, I was the head of sales and marketing at the time, and we did a slide to convince people that they should buy bigger ethernets. Because in those days, ethernet was an add-on, it wasn't built in. And that slide basically said, you bought three of my cards, ethernet cards last year, you should buy 30 this year. It was a sales slide. But, but in 1990, it became Metcalf's Law which said that the value of a network grows as the square of the number of users. I'll get to your question in a second. So the, the, the law says the value of a network grows as the square of the number of users. And for 25 years, professors have been arguing about whether it should, it's the square or uh, the most recent breakthrough is n log n. Uh, it, the law needs revision, but any, in any case, n log n isn't it. But it basically says when you connect things together, they become more valuable. And certainly that's true in innovation. So you've heard of clusters. In fact, we just saw a video that listed what I think is George's um, conception of what the clusters are here in Georgia. FinTech, for example, is a, there's a FinTech, clearly a FinTech cluster here. The cluster theory of innovation, which has been around some time, I think is a subset of the network theory of innovation, which is to say uh, startups innovation occurs in networks of people, and the better connected some of them are, the more effective that innovation process is. And a cluster is a case where the network is very densely connected. So in the, in the Georgia area, there's, in FinTech in particular, there must be this tight interconnection of all the FinTech people. Uh, as a cluster in that network. So if you've heard the expression that every, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, I'm a networking guy, so everything looks like networking to me, and that's, certainly that includes innovation. So in developing our startups, the way I advise our students is to, uh, and professors, is to work on their networks, their networks of uh, team members, their networks of customers, their networks of suppliers, their networks of, of the band, the, the infrastructure that helps them along. You want to, is that uh, answered your question or would you like to ask it a different way? No, that answers it. Really, I just wanted you to explain Metcalf's Law so one day I could say I was there when he explained Metcalf's Law. So <laughs> that was really it. <laughs> well, I've been defending it for 25 years and it, I believe it's exactly correct in every detail. <laughs> So one of the things I've noticed in the building of the Longhorn Startup Program, uh, we have uh, incubation space. And I saw the incubation space here yesterday at Georgia Tech, it's very impressive. There are now a gazillion incubators, startup incubators around the United States and elsewhere, and accelerators and combinators, Y combinators, I call them whateverators, and uh, we have some. And there seems to be, uh, a, they're booming now. And they're exhilarating events. I mean, I'm sure you have them every week here in Atlanta. There's one today. You're about, we're about to see 10 innovative companies. That would be sort of a showcase 
what we do is we showcase the participants in our incubators. And I've begun worrying about these incubators because everyone believes, uh, everyone involved, we're very enthusiastic about them, I am too, as if they never happened before. But if you're old enough, you know that incubators came and went, and then they came and went, and now they're back again. And that's, you need to pay attention to that because why did they go away before? And why did they come back? And why did they go away? And they, so it's a cyclical thing that we, we somehow forget why they failed last time. And then we start them anew and we, and we love them. And then somehow they peek out. And I think the reason they peek out is this. The criteria for winning a business plan competition turns out not to be the same criteria for being successful in business. So we have the, the, one of the ways in which these contests diverge and eventually fail is that the, the, the processes we develop for judging companies over the weekend or uh, turn out to be different criteria than reality uses for evaluating them in the wild. So we need to be careful to keep our contests, which I'm all for, but we need to keep them evaluating companies and pros prospective companies based on criteria related to reality rather than um, winning contests. A very good example of that is I was invited to MIT's 100K business plan competition after being 10 years as a venture capitalist. And I was given one hour to evaluate 10 company pitches. And I, and I noticed something. When I go to work as a venture capitalist, I spend all day, every day calling, doing what's called due diligence and calling customers and finding out that it wasn't such a good meeting that the company had. The company said, we, we visited Walmart. We had a great meeting there. And then I call Walmart and they say, who? So when, when you do contests, there's no, very often the contests are broken and that there's no time for due diligence. So the companies can claim anything in the contest and there's no due diligence to check. That's just an example of a way in which these whatever raters uh, fail. Another hot spot in innovation is uh, what's called social innovation. So at, for example, at the University of Texas, we have the Dell Social Innovation Challenge. And Susie Sosa runs that. And Susie and I meet occasionally to see if there's anything in common between social innovation and what I do, which I must, must be called anti-social innovation. So this is the idea. This is a different kind of startup, these social innovation uh, uh, social startups. And this is social in the sense of social good, not social in the sense of Facebook. Uh, these are uh, startups who have the peculiar feature that their investors don't want their money back. My investors want their money back, but social innovators don't, they, that, I don't know where they find them, but they find investors who don't want their money back. And that, but everything else seems to be the same. That is, the, the way you organize, the, uh, the way you evaluate, the way you move forward as a startup seems to be in common between the social and the anti-social uh, startups, except for that one thing, which is the characteristic of your investors. And speaking of investors, also innovation in, uh, is there a question there? Please. Sure. Joe Wilson. Whoa. I am uh, another fellow annoying New York kid. Yeah. What uh, breakthroughs do you expect in smart uh, energy, and where is the cluster located? Oh, I know where the cluster is. Um, <laughs> I meant the technology cluster, not the, <laughs> the innovation cluster. <laughs> <laughs> so for 10 years, I was an energy investor in uh, Massachusetts, energy technology investor. And, um, and then I moved to Texas, and then I, I discovered where the cluster is, and it's, uh, it's not in Austin, it's in Houston, actually. So we're gonna solve energy, we haven't solved it yet, we're gonna solve energy with the help of the people who live in Houston, because they understand scale, scale energy. So they know about thermodynamics. Uh, I noticed that the, my friends in Massachusetts are big uh, alternative energy, as I am, uh, enthusiasts, and we've been trying to build a, a wind farm in, uh, off the coast of Martha's Vineyard for at least 10 years. Texas already has 8% of its energy coming from the wind already. Uh, and then there's the big surprise that occurred in energy, which occurred in Houston, Texas. 
which is saving the United States' bacon right now. It's called fracking. So we, uh, we now have cheap, domestic, low, relatively low carbon energy coming. Uh, and it's, it's saving our economy and it's, it's helping solve energy. I'm, I'm viewing that as a bridge to eventually getting to zero carbon energy. Let's see. Uh, so I've answered where the cluster is. Well, what's the rest of your question? I guess what's the next breakthrough? Is it something in smart grid or distributed uh, generation or what? It's this company I'm an investor in. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Yes, yeah, so there's four of them if you have time. Uh, I think what we need to be doing is using the bridge that's been built for us by the discovery of, um, of uh, fracking of natural gas and oil, which gives us a bridge to the future now. Because we're, did you know the United States did not sign the Kyoto Accords? Do you remember that? Right. All the people who did sign the Kyoto Accords, their CO2 emissions are up. The United States has reduced its CO2 emissions by 20%, reduced them, and we didn't sign the Kyoto Accords. So what is the next development? I think it's going to come out of Houston, whatever it is. So I'm encouraging all my energy technology companies to move to Houston, because there's a cluster there. There's people who understand how to, how to scale energy. Um, the other big surprise in energy is that when I got into energy investing, the assumption was the way we were going to organize innovation there was like this. We were going to make energy expensive, fossil-based energy expensive, to provide a, a, a high ceiling so the alternative energy um, alternatives could come to market under this high cost of, of fossil fuel, you know, burden it with carbon taxes and taxes in general. And what we found out is if you make energy expensive, you drive the economy into recession. So let's not do that. Instead, let's lower the energy of alternative, lower the cost of alternative energy instead of raising the cost of fossil fuels. And that's a, that's, that's a surprise. And I think that's working out now. And uh, one of my companies is trying to lower the cost of solar energy below the cost of coal. That's our goal, using, uh, using the sun. Other questions? I have 29 minutes and 11 seconds. So another thing that's going on in innovation is the reduction of frictions in the financing market. There is this idea out there that we need more money into that little two by two matrix that I described before. If only we had more money, we would have uh, more innovation. So the IPOs have gotten uh, easier to do. You don't have to be profitable, for example, I remember when Groupon, Groupon was faced with a decision, go bankrupt or go public. <laughs> I think they're going to do it in the, <laughs> the wrong order. <laughs> so they're going public, uh, all, fiddling around with going public. And then there's the rise of angel investors. Now, having been a VC for 10 years, I take this personally, because the angels disparage venture capitalists at every opportunity. Well, they disparage them until the A round, where they don't have any more money. And they want their, the people that they've been disparaging for two years, the VCs, to suddenly invest in their companies. That's what's happening right now. It's called the A crunch, where the, uh, the angels, anyway, I love angels. I was debating uh, the angels in Austin, and it made me realize that my own company had been funded by angels. I didn't realize it at the time. I didn't realize it. but. I should have remembered when Bob Noyce, the founder of Intel, said that he would invest in the company. I, realized, I should have realized that was an, an angel group. It just happened to be Bob Noyce, the founder of Intel, sitting there. He was an angel investing in my company. So my own company was angel invested, so I, I love angels. But now we're going beyond angels. We're going to crowdsourcing, the funding of companies uh, with crowdsourcing. So one of our startups at UT decided to use Kickstarter as a method of financing. And I advised them against this, being a, a, a codger. And uh, they ignored me, as they often do. And they went to Kickstarter, and they, they decided to raise $50,000 to develop a 3D camera. And they just closed the $100,000 on Kickstarter. And they didn't sell any equity or any cameras. 
it's sort of like a social innovation. They have investors who don't want their money back, apparently. So that's all happening. My worry about crowdsourcing, of course, is that it, it resembles uh, too much. It could become a lottery. And we already have too many lotteries, that is, people who can't afford to investing in things that they shouldn't invest in and losing all their money. And uh, I'm worried about crowdsourcing. Uh, by the way, my worrying about it will not stop it. It's going to go forward. Um, so then, and then there's governments. So one of the things governments do is cluster development. The uh, Economic Development Department, University of Texas is doing this. They, what are the clusters in our area? And they begin developing clusters. And a special version of this is uh, I found in China 10 years ago. China is very much into uh, uh, industrial policy. And they created a place called Shenzhen, which is famous now. Have you all heard of Shenzhen? I, and I visited there a long time ago and was sitting next to the, uh, I think her name was Madame Wu, and she was head, uh, I think her, that was her name, and she was head of the Ministry of Industry and Technology. And they were very proud of Shenzhen as a special economic zone. And uh, we do this in the United States too. A special economic zone is when a government takes all the bad rules that they've passed and they choose a small geography and they say all of our rules that discourage innovation we're not going to enforce in this little area right over here. In the case of China, it was Shenzhen. So I'm sitting with uh, Madame Wu and I say, I've just been to Shenzhen, it's fantastic, it's booming, it's great. Uh, and by the way, you needed a passport to get into Shenzhen. Even if you're a Chinese citizen, you were not allowed into Shenzhen without a passport under spe with special permission because they didn't want the people outside of Shenzhen to see how good life was inside of Shenzhen. So I turned to Madame Wu and I said, hey, I have an idea. Why don't you make all of China into a special economic zone? And she immediately forgot how to speak English. I'd like to encourage governments everywhere, when you get this idea of creating a special economic zone, you should kind of think of maybe making your whole territory a special economic zone with lower taxes and less regulation and all that stuff. <laughs> so speaking of industrial policy, the United States of America has embarked on that path. And a, a very good, speaking of energy, a very good case of it is energy, where, for example, we created out of the Department of Energy a new agency called ARPA-E, which is patterned after ARPA, which is a defense agency. And ARPA was very successful in promoting research, and I think ARPA-E is also. But then we created an entity to loan money to startups to build out, to scale up their energy technologies. And the most famous case of that is, what, who can name the most famous case of that? Solyndra. Solyndra. So let me tell you how, what went wrong with Solyndra. And I say that I, I wasn't in the meetings. I'm imagining what the meetings were like. Here's Solyndra, uh, Silicon Valley startup, brilliant people, well-financed. And they were faced with one of the most difficult decisions that a startup, particularly an energy startup, has, which is when to scale. Is our technology far enough along now that we can scale it 2x or 5x or 10x? So is it time and how many x should we scale? And I've been to that board, not the Cylindra one, but I've been to that board meeting 50 times. Oh, are we far enough along to put some serious money into scaling this and how much should we scale it? 2x, 5x, 10x, 100x. And in that board meeting, imagine somebody walks in who's gripped with urgency, and they say the following three things. Uh, the world is heating up and is about to explode from the, all the global warming that's going on, and you guys make solar panels, so we need you to hurry up to save Earth. Two. Our economy is in recession. We need jobs. So we really need you to scale up so you can hire lots of people. And three, there's an election coming soon, and we've got to show results really soon. So why don't you hurry up and scale up? And that's exactly what Cylindra did. And of course, they scale, history will report that they scaled up too soon, and they uh, got slaughtered. So that's one of the bugs with 
uh, industrial policy, especially relating to innovation. When you start interfering with that very complicated process of deciding when to scale up and bringing to it political urgency. Is there another question yet? Someone should be annoyed about that story I just told. 21 minutes to go. So another development in uh, entrepreneurship and innovation are uh, universities. So for example, the University of Texas thought it was a good idea to recruit me to come and be a professor of innovation. There wasn't one of those before. That's sort of an innovation, which I'm very much enjoying. Uh, some universities have turned entirely to entrepreneurship. So Babson College, I'm a graduate of the Sloan School of Management at MIT, and we refer to that really important business school up the river, Babson. Anyone from the Harvard Business School here? That's a joke. <laughs> Harvard is up the river from MIT, but we refer to Babson, which is further up the river from Harvard. Anyway, so Babson is an entrepreneurial university, and they're frequently ranked number one in entrepreneurship. Uh, then you have the MBA programs, including uh, uh, many schools, including Harvard, uh, which have strong entrepreneurship and growing entrepreneurship activities. Then you have entirely new universities. Today you're going to hear from Ray Kurzweil, who happens also to be the founder of Singularity University, in, uh, mostly in Mountain View, California. And that university is focused on uh, very large scale entrepreneurship, solving the grand challenges of the world. And I just ran into another one, uh, Draper University in uh, Redwood City, California founded by Tim Draper, a little university just aimed at entrepreneurs. Of course, then you have the opposite. You have Peter Thiel. You all heard of Peter Thiel? Have you heard of Peter Thiel? He is the coolest guy. I've never met him, but he is so cool. He's a PayPal founder. Uh, he's offering scholarships to students to not attend university and instead start companies. And it's... Uh, it freaks universities out. Uh, MIT has a freshman this year who turned down a Teal scholarship to start as a freshman at MIT. We're very proud of her. Um, but it's very tempting to be offered $100,000 to not go to school and instead start a company. That's sort of the counter trend. So Peter doesn't value, uh, in fact, he asked the qu first question I asked when I went to the University of Texas is, can you teach entrepreneurship? And apparently he, he doesn't think so. At least, at least not at a university. Let's see, I got 19 minutes. Question. Yes. Recent innovations, we are talking about big data, driverless cars, 3D printing. In your opinion, uh, what else do you think would change or make an impact in our world? Thank you. Uh, so the This may not be your world. In my world, the three hot topics are social, mobile, and cloud. Is that familiar? Social, mobile, cloud. And, as, and if you've been around for, you know buzzwords like that, like cloud, for example, that word has been around for 30 years. It just took a new meaning. Big data, I guess, is uh, big data might reasonably be on that list also. I think the new list, which you began to sketch, is uh, 3D printing. So as we, we've taken a renewed interest in manufacturing and 3D printing offers a really new cut at manufacturing. So 3D, everything seems to be emergent. Robots seem to be emergent. And space travel seems to be emergent. Uh, <laughs> let's talk afterwards. Uh, but going to your question, I think that the uh, the internet has been, you know, the internet was built starting in 69, really started blossoming in 94, and now it's been the, the, the perpetrator of a series of disruptions, and, and I use that word disruption in the positive sense of Clayton Christensen of Harvard Business School, music, books, television, radio, newspapers, long list of disruptions. There are three new industries, in answer to your question, that I think are ripe for innovation and disruption. And they're big ones. They're the biggest ones there are. There is energy that we've talked a little bit about. So the, 
the internet is beginning to disrupt energy. Uh, here's a great example. Uh, one of the ways the internet is, is uh, disrupting energy is by example. That is, what we're learning, what we learn from how we built the internet can be applied to how we build energy, how we solve energy. And one of the first lessons has to do with storage. When the internet was first started in 69, there was zero, almost zero storage in the telecommunication system. In fact, it was important that your telephone conversations get through in 100 or 200 milliseconds. So there couldn't be any storage. It had to go right through. And what have we done as we've built the internet? We've just added storage. There's storage everywhere. I've got gigabytes in my pocket here connected to the internet. Even now, as I'm standing here, thanks to Wi-Fi, this storage is on the internet. Well, the same is, a, is playing out in energy. So storage is one of the ways we're solving energy, and we're doing it in much the same way that we did with the internet. Healthcare is the second one. Healthcare is a huge problem. That's an industry that really seriously needs disruption. And, uh, and the internet is helping with that. And then the third one, which I'd really like to talk more about, is education. And I want to talk about it because it, uh, universities love to innovate everybody else, but they don't so much like innovating themselves which is what's about to happen thanks to the internet. Question? Yes, you uh, mentioned Clayton Christensen, and um, Christensen talks about three different types of technological innovations, the ones that sustain jobs, the ones that destroy jobs but free up capital, and the ones that create jobs. What do you see in these innovations that are likely to lead to a net growth in jobs? That's a, that's a difficult question. It's, and it, it's a card I skipped over here. Uh, it is not the purpose of companies, particularly startups, to create jobs. But very often that's what they're asked to do, and that's, I think, a mistake. So jobs are a pleasant byproduct of innovation. They are not the purpose. If you're running a company, it is not your job to hire as many people as possible or you will send your company right down the drain if you do. So when the government comes and says, we want to start a company here for, to create jobs, you, you need to be careful with that. So the, uh, I've been listening carefully. The University of, uh, I'm sorry, the state of Texas has just allocated a couple of years ago $3 billion to cure cancer. But frequently you will hear it said that that $3 billion is to create jobs. And as a taxpayer of the state of Texas, uh, I want to cure cancer with that $3 billion. And if we create some jobs, that's great, but that shouldn't be the goal. And if you hire managers to run that fund whose purpose is to create jobs, you will not cure cancer. I would like to point out that the war on cancer was started by Richard Nixon in 1971. And we haven't cured cancer yet. We need to get going on that. So anyway, I'm just complaining about the uh, how directly you go for jobs and whether j jobs is something you go right at or whether it's something that you get by trying to solve the world's problems. And, uh, and if you haven't figured it out by now, I don't know how to answer your question as to what, which of these activities leads to further employment and which doesn't. We want to bring manufacturing back to the U.S., but. Uh, as uh, Stephen pointed out to me yesterday, we're not going to bring back the five jobs of people who know how to operate a wrench, as he put it. We're going to bring back one job of somebody who knows how to operate a robot that operates a wrench. So the, uh, the calculus there is indeterminate. I, I can't answer your question. I don't know how we're going to um, create jobs directly. Let me talk about the, th I have 12 minutes and 43 seconds left. Let me talk about uh, the third area. So there was energy and healthcare, two major industries about to be interrupted, uh, disrupted by the internet. The third one is education. So I was recently at a uh, MIT trustees meeting and they asked us how many people have ever graduated from MIT? And uh, no, no one knew, but it was, as I recall, 85,000. And then they said, how many people are currently registered for our new online course in computer programming? And the answer was 125,000 students were registered for this course. And, and so here, MIT took its best computer programming course, put it on the internet, and got 125,000 
people to register. Now only 20,000 finished, uh, only, only. So the critics say, well, yeah, you started with 120, but you ended with 20. And the enthusiasts like myself say, yeah, but we had 20,000 people finish that course. So those are the, that's called the MOOC, the phenomenon which is big at the University of uh, at Georgia Tech. The MOOCs are coming, and the university system is about to be seriously disrupted, and it's making all the same sounds that bookstores made when Amazon came along, and all the same sounds that music stores made when iTunes came along. And the universities are making all those same sounds. And my favorite version of that is the argument that the MOOC, which puts education online, puts too much distance between the teacher and the student. The Socratic method of teaching is disrupted by interposing this technology, and therefore it's a bad idea. Well, by that same reasoning, the book was a bad idea. And by the way, one of the early spellings of the word book was B-O-O-C which sounds a lot like MOOC, M-O-O-C. And books were a bad idea because you used to sit around the fire and hear stories directly from the storyteller. But thanks to books, you don't even meet that storyteller anymore, and sometimes they're dead. <laughs> so MOOCs are a good idea like books are a good idea, or were a good idea. And of course, the current version of MOOCs are just the first cut. It's sort of like the pre-iTunes, it's the MP3 version of what later became iTunes. And uh, we're going to be disrupting education in really big ways. So I am now enrolled, my son and I are both enrolled in 600X, which is MIT's Introduction to Computer Science and Programming. And I now do uh, uh, weekly problem sets, 600X, and I'm learning to program in Python. This is also an excuse to argue with my son. And he said, but dad, you have, a, you have a computer science PhD. That doesn't seem fair. I said, yeah, but it was only from Harvard. And it was, <laughs> and it was 40 years ago, so I need a refresher. So I'm taking this uh, 6 x course. Some questions with our remaining nine minutes. Thank you. I hope you don't think this is off topic, but one of the things that we've been talking about is specifically about software and how you know, different types of technology will impact it. The synthesis of that is 3D printing. What type of impact do you think that will have in our environment, both logistics and in manufacturing? I'm not an expert on 3D printing, although I am at the University of Texas where laser sintering was invented in 1980. And it's a little funny, 3D printing recently became hot, and the and University of Texas discovered that one of its inventors was actually a faculty member, so we've, he's become famous suddenly. So we have 3D printers all over University of Texas, and there's something going on there. I don't claim to understand it. My wife's a food expert, and she's looking forward to printing food. No, that, that's being done in restaurants being done in Russia? It is being done in restaurants. The reason I'm asking is it could be a, a very disruptive technology for logistics and manufacturing. Don't need a wrench. You still, like you talked about programming. I know the government's doing running experiments and creating military parts on demand in remote bases using 3D printing. Titanium parts. So, just I just didn't know if, if you had any opinion on that and where, where it was going. Well, print, you know, printing on demand is one of its features, but the, the other feature which I've noticed is you can print things that you can't otherwise build. So there are now parts, I was told there are parts in modern jetliners that were 3D printed because you yes. couldn't cast them or mill them. It was best to 3D print them. So, but once again, I don't claim to be a, I'm just very excited about 3D. I have no idea how it's gonna play out. Well, I'm considering we're talking about how you're talking about innovation, you could actually go back to the garage and people are creating things through their own programming that never existed before. Yes. And actually testing it in the market. And then building them as requested. There's several people that built businesses like that. So that's why I was curious if, you, if you've been exposed to it. Well, 3D is breaking out all over. One of our startups now has a, uh, at the, one of our student startups now is a 3D camera, the Kickstarter company. Mm -hmm. And they, they can take their camera and make a model of something and then print it. A 3D model of something, mm -hmm. including a person. 
They don't get the inside quite right, but they get the outside. We're actually doing custom images like that for bobbleheads now. Bobbleheads? Yeah, just as low-end stuff, but it's still a, a business model. These people are making money. So one of the startups at South by Southwest Accelerator, the big conference we just yeah. had, yeah. was a toy company where the, the, the young child designs their own doll, and then the doll gets delivered oh, yeah. a few days later, printed, having been printed to spec. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Please. Hi, Bob. Really appreciate you being here. Um, you mentioned education as kind of the third area of innovation. You talked a lot about it from the um, uh, college level. But what about from the standpoint um, at, with elementary education? Because what I'm seeing, I have three kids, what I'm seeing is, you know, we, we can't even help, we're not able to educate our kids to get to a level where they can get into the MITs and Georgia Techs without the foundation. What are you seeing maybe innovation-wise that we can do uh, for elementary education? Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's, it's another question I'm marginally qualified to answer, but I think one, one of the neat things about MOOCs, and that's just a placeholder word, that word will go away over time, and the, it'll evolve rapidly. But when you can, at that scale, educate millions of people, they don't all have to be 18 years old. They don't all have to be in a special physical location. They can be at any age. That includes me taking an introduction to Python, and that includes a high school student. So when I was uh, bragging on Twitter about finishing problem set number five of 600X, my high school principal, I don't know him, he's the principal of the high school that I went to, reached out and said, can my students take this course? And the answer is, of course, you just go on the web. And so these high school students can begin taking college uh, classes if they want uh, in high school or grade school. MIT is now wondering, what will this online education do to their freshman curriculum? That is now, many of the freshmen arriving at school have already taken many of the courses that the university can offer. So how does that change the nature of university and the, the, the classic four-year model? So I think if your question was about students younger, I think younger and older both get affected uh, by this. We're gonna solve ignorance <laughs> by making education dirt cheap. And the internet's gonna do that. All right, four minutes to go. Do you want me to end early? Or do you have another question? I'm just dying to hear subsequent speakers. Thank you very much.